I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension, and our topic tonight is organic pesticides, understanding use and safety. And, um, and I recognize that organic pesticides are just one tool that organic farmers have at their disposal to manage pests. And we'll talk more about the importance of integrated pest management. But I thought it would be interesting tonight to focus on organic pesticides. So here's the outline of what I'd like to cover tonight. And again, as we go through this material and you, you think about these, these uh, particular aspects of organic pesticides, if you have any questions at any point, please enter them into the chat. So we'll be talking a quick an overview of what organic pesticides are. We'll talk about uh, the principles of IPM, integrated pest management, and how they relate to the use of organic pesticides. Then we'll talk about uh, some, some quick thoughts on pest weeds and diseases and some of the organic pesticides that are available to manage both uh, insect uh, pests, weeds, and, uh, and diseases. We'll talk about pesticides in the environment for the moment because the safe use of organic pesticides extends to minimizing the environmental impact of their use. And so we'll spend a few minutes talking about that. Then we'll spend some time talking about understanding pesticides themselves. And in particular, we'll delve into the pesticide label because there is a wealth of useful information found on that label to help guide the safe use of that particular organic pesticide. We'll talk a bit about safety and personal protective equipment, and then we'll finish out with some thoughts on, on safe handling, safe storage, and safe disposal of pesticides and pesticide containers. So what is an organic pesticide? Well, this is, this is like one of those things where everyone kind of knows what it is, but uh, it can be a little difficult to actually define it. So um, when we think about the, uh, the uh, definition of an organic pesticide, we have some guidance here in the United States. And in fact, um, to some degree, the definition of an organic pesticide has been legislated. And uh, here in the United States, we have two federal agencies that have primary roles from the standpoint of, of uh, regulating organic pesticides. And those are the Environmental Protection Agency, largely through the uh, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. That's abbreviated as FIFRA and, and uh, other acts as well. And then the USDA and specifically through the National Organic Program, which we will abbreviate as the NOP. Now, from the standpoint of these two agencies, uh, their view of organic pesticides and organic pesticide use is, yes, indeed, they're a tool. They uh, can certainly be used by organic farmers. Uh, they broadly define them as pesticides derived from natural sources and pesticides that include synthetic substances within the regulations of the USDA uh, National Organic Program. Yes, they, they, again, recognize that these are tools, but they also uh, stress throughout the, uh, the regulatory atmosphere that these are tools to be used only if other strategies and cultural management practices fail to control pests and diseases. So let's talk about the, uh, the roles that these agencies play. And again, it's important to understand this because this is, uh, this is uh, really the, the uh, basis of the definition of organic pesticides from the standpoint of their use in, in the United States. So starting with the Environmental Protection Agency, this is the federal agency that has the primary role in regulating pesticides, both the approval of pesticides, the labels that are placed on pesticides and the regulations that surround their use. This includes organic pesticides. Now they have actually ceded though some of this responsibility to the USDA. And when a claim is put on a pesticide label that it is indeed an organic product, that claim is based upon USDA standards. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment. There are a group of what are defined as minimum risk pesticides. And these are pesticides that are very low in toxicity. Um, in many cases, they are, they are actually uh, uh, not toxic to humans at all. In some cases, they're actually uh, uh, allowable for humans to consume, but they may have pesticidal activity. And the uh, EPA has recognized that these are minimum risk pesticides and they are exempt from US EPA review. And this includes the requirement for what's called a tolerance level or an allowable limit for the residue of these, these minimum risk pesticides on the things that we eat. And so again, there are a number of things that are used as pesticides, but because of their low toxicity are not regulated as pesticides. Now, even with uh, this uh, situation in place at the federal level, there is the possibility that state agencies may require registration of these minimum risk pesticides. Remember that in many cases, 
state agencies are actually allowed to have regulations that are more severe than federal regulations. Uh, some states have retained that right. And uh, we have to keep that in mind when we think about the use of these minimum risk pesticides. So uh, what are some examples of minimum risk pesticides? Well, here's uh, some examples that uh, I found recently published on a list from EPA. And these include cedar oil, citronella, corn gluten meal, dried blood, garlic oil, lemongrass oil, mint oil, egg solid, salt, soybean oil, and thyme. So again, uh, these materials can be applied to, to plants it, from, from the standpoint of pest management without regulation from the standpoint of the Environmental Protection Agency. So it's important to keep this in mind. Now let's talk about the role that the USDA National Organic Program plays in the regulation of organic pesticides. So the Organic Foods Production Act was passed in 1990. And one of the provisions of that act requires the US Secretary of Agriculture to establish a national list of allowed and prohibited substances for use in organic production. Now, who is, uh, you know, who, who, who advises the Secretary of Agriculture on what should be or should not be on this list? Well, it's actually a panel that includes uh, people who have expertise and experience in organic production, including farmers. And so uh, again, this is an informed list. The uh, EPA then uses this list to place organic uh, notifications on pesticide labels. So again, it has to first uh, uh, reach the, the level of, of being on the national list of allowed substances before the EPA will place an organic notice on the pesticide label. And again, for more information, you can check out this uh, USDA site that I have listed here on, on uh, the, uh, the slide. So again, what is on the national list of allowed substances? Well, uh, typically these materials are naturally occurring substances. They could be biologicals, they could be botanicals, they could be minerals or, uh, or uh, elements of, of various types. Or there are certain synthetic substances that are allowed, uh, that, are, that are on the allowed substances list. And this primarily includes oils, soaps, alcohols, and certain chemicals. Now, what would be among the prohibited substances? Well, there are naturally occurring substances that are on the prohibited list. You know, for example, uh, uh, nicotine is a naturally occurring substance, but is definitely on the prohibited substances list. And most synthetically derived pesticides are on this list as, as well. And again, if you wanna take a look at the actual list, here is the uh, website where you can view the list. Keep in mind that uh, most pesticides include not only active ingredients, which are what we just described, but also what are called inert ingredients. These are, are uh, you know, the, the bulk of what is in many pesticide formulations. And if we look at these two labels here, we can see in the case of Nemix 4.5, that the active ingredient, which is azadiractin, is only about 4.5% of what's in that package. The rest is inert ingredients. And in the case of Diapel DF, it's about 54% active ingredient and then 46% other ingredients. It's interesting, and, uh, sorry, Patrick, to inter interject. It's interesting that it's called neem mix because I would assume it's like neem oil. It is primarily neem oil, but uh, occasionally there are other substances in these various neem oil mixes. But this particular formulation is just basodiractin, so it's strictly uh, just neem oil. Okay, understood. But uh, again, notice that uh, or it's important to recognize that the uh, USDA NLP list also applies to these inert ingredients. You know, there, there could be the situation where an inert, an inert ingredient would not be allowable in an organic production scheme. And if that's the case, then the, uh, the pesticide would not be allowed on the, or would not be found on the allowed substances list. So the EPA looks at not just the active ingredient, but also the inert ingredients that are present in pesticide formulations. Okay, do we have any questions at this point, Hannah? Uh, we don't currently have questions, but feel free to submit any questions that you may have into the chat if need be. Now, there are state-based organic programs, and these are frequently uh, a part of a State Department of Agriculture or something similar. You know, for example, here are the seals from the, uh, the uh, California State Organic Program and the Washington State Department of Agriculture Organic Program. And these organic programs do have the, uh, the uh, ability to regulate pesticides as well within their states. And some of these state uh, programs have indeed regulated pesticides 
at a level that's perhaps even more intense than at the federal level. So if you're located in a state that has a state organic program, it's important to, uh, to uh, check their regulations as well as far as what is allowed and what is not allowed in organic production. There is another level of uh, management of organic pesticides and that's at the certification level. And if you're a farm that has undergone organic certification, uh, in most situations, you're working with an organic certifier. Uh, in a few cases, these are state-based, state agency-based state agency uh, certifiers, but in many cases, they are, are private organizations that offer organic certification. And it's very important to check with an organic certifier to see what is and is not allowed. You know, for example, there may be materials that are on the, uh, the NLP list that are not allowed by certain certifying organizations. So it's important to check there as well. And then finally, it's important to, to, to uh, mention the Organic Materials Review Institute, or, or again, abbreviated as OMRI. OMRI is an independent agency that reviews uh, products that are labeled as organic against organic production standards. And uh, organic or, or OMRI approval is uh, generally considered to be necessary before a material, uh, again, the, the EPA does not directly uh, base its decisions on OMRI listing, but it definitely takes OMRI listing into account as it develops labels for, for uh, pesticides that would be used in an organic production practice. And so frequently on uh, the pesticide label, you'll see the OMRI seal, the one that we see here in the upper right. And again, this is uh, an important thing to look for. It supports organic integrity. And uh, the uh, institute, the, the boards at the institute are, again, are made up of people who have uh, have a considerable knowledge of organic production practices and knowledge of pesticides and pesticide use. So check out the OMRI website. They have listings of the uh, uh, materials, the pesticides that have passed their inspection. So it, when, when, a, when a product receives the OMRI listed seal, that's considered to be the gold seal from the standpoint of organic pesticide labeling. Okay. Any questions about what is and is not allowable as far as an organic pesticide in the United States? I don't see any questions at this time. Okay, let's spend just a few moments talking about integrated pest management. And we've had entire workshops on this, and uh, this is definitely not going to be an in-depth uh, discussion of, of IPM, but it is important to consider IPM because uh, the use of organic pesticides are just one tool within an overall IPM or integrated pest management strategy. So what is IPM? It's an ecologically based pest control strategy and it relies upon cultural practices. And, and uh, again, you know, these cultural practices help maintain crop health, they encourage natural controls, and they're in place to prevent or minimize insect or disease incidents. And, and again, um, part of IPM is understanding pest dynamics and uh, it, it, uh, part of IPM is monitoring of the crop, again, to, to look for evidence of insect uh, disease or weed issues, and then to develop strategies to manage those issues. And again, the use of army listed pesticides is, is one tool, but uh, under the, uh, the uh, umbrella of, of IPM, this is a tool that is meant to be used only sparingly and at the right time and in the right way. And the uh, remainder of our time together will be focused on how to use organic pesticides at the right time and in the right way. And, and IPM is, is not just something the large scale farms practice, it's not just something the small scale farms practice, it's adaptable to scale of any size. And it's also a useful uh, strategy in, in home gardens. So I encourage home gardeners to consider uh, integrated pest management as well. Now, the uh, management tactics or strategies that are, that are available in an IPM overall IPM umbrella include biological control, genetic control, cultural control, mechanical control, and chemical control, or the use of organic pesticides. So if we take a look at this uh, series of pictures around the uh, slide, we'll notice first that upper picture, that's a picture of an eggplant leaf that has an uh, aphid infestation. But if we look more closely, what appear to be aphids under uh, close inspection are actually the dried out shells of aphids. And if we look even more closely, we'll notice at the end of the abdomen of each one of these uh, uh, shells of an aphid, there's a neat little hole. And these are aphids that have been parasitized by a type of wasp. It's a tiny, tiny wasp. It's a, a native naturally occurring biological control. 
And if we uh, take, make efforts to support the populations of these wasps, they can be quite effective in helping manage aphid issues. The next slide down shows uh, uh, grafted tomatoes. And this is an example of genetic control where the use of a rootstock that has genetic resistance to soil-borne diseases allows farmers to grow tomatoes in soils that are infested with these diseases if the tomato plant is grafted onto a suitable rootstock. If you were to take the ungrafted plant, plant it in this infested soil, it would soon die. But again, through the use of a resistant rootstock, we can take advantage of genetic control of soil-borne diseases. Uh, the third shot down, that's a squash buck. And if uh, you've grown uh, vine crops, particularly squash, sooner or later, you're going to come up against squash bugs. And uh, some examples of cultural control uh, from the standpoint of squash bug management, um, there's a very elegant approach called trap cropping. There are certain types of squash that, re that release high levels of a naturally occurring compound called cucurbitacin. And the uh, squash bug finds cucurbitacin irresistible. In fact, it's the uh, signal that guides the squash bug to the, to the uh, squash plant. And so farmers can plant these certain types of squash in a perimeter ring around uh, and other, other types of squash that don't release this, this chemical in such high amounts. And it will preferentially draw the squash bugs to the uh, uh, selected squash uh, area, that, that perimeter area, which we now call the trap crop. And once the squash bugs arrive at the trap crop, then there can be measures in place to dispose of them. So again, that's a good example of, uh, of uh, uh, cultural control. The next slide over where we see a, a hand holding onto some insect exclusion netting is an example of mechanical control. And there are nettings that we can place over plants to exclude insects. In this particular case, it's a very fine mesh net that's used to exclude spotted wing drosophila, which is a very damaging pest on raspberries from a tunnel full of raspberry plants. And by screening the entrances to this tunnel and, and the events to the tunnel with this insect exclusion netting, we can keep spotted wing drosophila out of the tunnel and manage that particular insect pest in that way. And then finally, chemical control. And we'll be focusing, of course, on the use of organic pesticides from the standpoint of this management tactic. So I think at this point, let's watch a quick video that outlines the, uh, the principles of IPM looking at, at apples in cedar apple rust. I'm Patrick Byers, field specialist in horticulture with University of Missouri Extension. Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, is a science-based, common-sense approach to managing the insects, diseases, weeds, and other pests that plague specialty crop growers. Let's talk about integrated pest management as it relates to disease management, and we'll use cedar apple rust as our model. Cedar apple rust is an interesting disease. Like many of the rust diseases, it shares two hosts, the cedar, the eastern red cedar, and an apple tree. And the disease spends part of its life cycle on one host and part of its life cycle on the other host. Cedar apple rust overwinters on the eastern red cedar as hard knots that we call galls. In April, after a rain, those galls will then erupt and develop these orange growths that are called teleohorns. At this stage, spores are then spreading from the cedar host to the apple. On the apple, the result will be orange to, to yellow spots on the foliage and sometimes on the fruit. In a year of severe infestation, there can be enough damage to the foliage that the leaves drop. And after a number of years of infection with cedar apple rust, the tree can be weakened and made susceptible to other problems. When we think about integrated pest management and disease management, it's, it's helpful to think about what's called the disease triangle. A triangle has three points, and when we talk about diseases, there are three points that we're interested in. Before a disease can become a problem, first of all, we need a susceptible host. Secondly, we need environmental conditions that favor the development of the disease. And third, we need the presence of the disease. In the case of cedar apple rust, let's take a look at each one of the points of that triangle. First of all, let's turn our attention to the apple tree. This apple tree is a cultivar called Enterprise. Enterprise has genetic resistance to cedar apple rust. In other words, the natural genetic makeup of this tree makes it resistant to the development of cedar rust disease. 
So that's very helpful from the standpoint of managing disease. Again, it's looking at that first point of the triangle, which is the presence of a susceptible host. Now let's talk about modifying the, the environment. And if we look at this tree, we notice that it has been pruned to a modified central leader system, a very open system. There's plenty of room for air to move throughout the branches of this tree. The foliage and the fruit dry quickly after a rain. Cedar rust is more of a problem if there are prolonged periods of wetting on the foliage and the fruit. So by training the tree in this fashion, we have developed an environment that is less favorable for the development of cedar apple rust. Third, let's take a look at the uh, presence of the disease. As I mentioned, cedar apple rust overwinters on the eastern red cedar, and it overwinters as these galls that we see here. If these galls are not present in the vicinity of the apple tree, then we have fewer problems with cedar apple rust. So one aspect of managing cedar apple rust is to eliminate the alternate host or the other side of the disease. If we notice that adjacent to our orchard, we have some eastern red cedar trees and it would be beneficial from the standpoint of managing cedar apple rust using IPM to remove those trees that would remove the overwintering side for this disease and reduce the amount of cedar apple rust that might be present close to our apple trees. So to review, from the standpoint of integrated pest management and diseases, it's useful to think about the disease triangle, the presence of a susceptible host, an environment that favors the disease, and the presence of the disease itself. In the case of cedar apple rust, by selecting resistant cultivars, by training and pruning the trees to an open structure, by removing the overwintering side of the disease, the eastern red cedars, we can reduce the situation of cedar apple rust infection in our apple orchard. All right, so now let's talk about the organic pesticides themselves. And the, from the standpoint of what is on the, uh, the uh, allowable list with the uh, National Organic Program, these are pesticides that, first of all, might be based upon microbial and microbial derived products. An example of this would be uh, uh, Bt, which is a commonly uh, used organic uh, insecticide that targets the larva of uh, butterflies and moths. And this is based upon a naturally occurring uh, a derivative from bacteria. There could be a minerals that are used as organic pesticides. There could be inorganic chemicals in a few cases that are used as, as organic pesticides. We have a wide range of botanicals that are used as organic pesticides. Some examples would be neem oil or uh, the uh, various pyrethrins. We have certain types of oils that are allowable in organic as organic pesticides. Uh, things such as uh, uh, stylet oil and, and a certain uh, highly refined oils. We also have a few synthetics that are allowable as organic pesticides, and I touched on what those are earlier. And then we have elements, elements such as sulfur and copper that are, are, are allowable as organic pesticides. And let's take an even closer look at what these materials are relative to what they manage. And we'll start with insects and insect relatives. And again, it's, it's very important important to correctly identify insects and to monitor their populations uh, when it comes to using organic insecticides. Uh, frequently, an organic insecticide is more useful at a particular stage in the insect's life cycle. So understanding life cycles is, is the first, role, first step in the uh, uh, effective use of organic insecticides. It's also important to, to monitor and uh, you know, for, for the presence of the pest and also the level of damage, because one of the uh, tenets of integrated pest management is understanding thresholds. And what, what this tells us is that in many cases, we can tolerate some level of the presence of an insect pest uh, without it damaging the crop to a point where we need to take, take action as far as management. And we need to understand what that threshold is. And if we start to see higher numbers of insects or we start to see a higher level of damage than an allowable threshold, then it's time to take action. And from the standpoint of using organic insecticides, timing is critical. Again, uh, if you, in many cases, organic insecticides do not have long residual periods. So if the insect is not present, you will not see control. And uh, if the insect is not at the correct growth stage in its life cycle, you will not see control. And again, recognizing the importance of thresholds, if you apply an insecticide, uh, before you've reached a threshold, you may have spent money that you didn't need to spend. You may actually have applied materials with the consequences of these applications when you didn't actually need them. 
So here are some examples of common organic insecticides. And we'll start with spinosad. Again, this is a microbially derived uh, material. It's, it uh, uh, comes from uh, certain types of bacteria. An example of a brand name is Entrust SC, and it works by targeting the uh, nerve centers of the insects. It's quite effective as an organic insecticide. The next one is pyrethrum. It's derived from uh, certain types of chrysanthemum species. An example is pyganic. Uh, it contact, or it uh, also targets the uh, nerve centers of, of insects. Uh, a commonly used organic insecticide is, is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis subspecies Kerstaki. This is what's found in the uh, brand product Dipel, again, microbial derived. It's a gut disruptor and pretty much targets just the larva of, ins of uh, butterflies and moths. Kaolin clay is another example of an organic insecticide. This is a naturally mined product, it's a mineral. Uh, a brand name would be Surround. It uh, works by providing a physical barrier to insects. It's also an irritant. Uh, it uh, uh, discourages insect activity on plants that have been treated with, with kale and clay. It does have some disease suppression activity as well. Another uh, organic insecticide is Bovaria bassiana. Mycotrol is a common brand name. This is, uh, again, a microbial or a biologically derived material. And uh, it uh, is actually, uh, uh, it's a type of fung fungus and the uh, preparation actually includes the spores of the material. And then when it's applied, it, uh, the, uh, the spores germinate on the body of the insect and they actually infect the insect and, and uh, cause it to, to uh, lose activity in some cases to die. Another example of a microbial uh, insecticide is Chromobacterium subsugae. And the brand name of that is Grandivo. And again, this material is uh, ingested by the insect and there's multiple targets. Uh, there are refined petroleum oils that are used as organic insecticides. An example is JMS stylet oil. And this is mainly a contact material. It actually has to contact the insect and, and uh, what it does is it interferes with the respiration of the insect. And then finally, neem, which is uh, derived from, a, a, uh, from, well, from the neem tree, uh, Chemically speaking, it's azadiractin, and sometimes uh, the uh, preparations are azadiractin plus other materials like the pyrethrums we mentioned earlier. And an example of one of these, uh, these combinations is azera. And again, uh, it uh, targets several different aspects of the insect, and it's also a uh, uh, repellent as well. So again, common organic insecticides. Now some thoughts on plant diseases. As I mentioned in the video, it's very important to understand the disease triangle and to recognize there are certain points in the uh, life cycle of a disease when uh, intervention with organic fungicides can be helpful. You know, in our discussion of cedar apple rust, for example, if you applied cedar, uh, 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 an organic fungicide to manage cedar apple rust in February, there would be no, no effect. If you applied it too late in the season, uh, say in, in July or August, uh, yes, you would see the symptoms of the disease on the tree, but applying a fungicide at this point has no benefit. The target time for uh, a cedar apple rust fungicide applications is in late April, because that's when the spores are spreading from the eastern red cedar to the, uh, the uh, apple tree. And recognize that in most cases, organic fungicides are, are what are called preventative applications. These, these fungicides are applied before the, the spores of a, of a fungal disease, for example, uh, or the, uh, the particles of a bacterial disease are actually present on the plant. In other words, they're there in, in place to form a barrier to the infection of that plant. So they have to be applied. Uh, the timing becomes very important as far as the application. Now, frequently we schedule these applications based on plant growth stages, but we also need to schedule these based upon environmental situations as well. There are a few cases where uh, fungicide sprays may be applied after infections to limit the spread. But again, as I said before, in most cases, uh, the uh, applications are made in advance of infections. Here are some common organic fungicides and bactericides. Copper hydroxide, an example is CHAMP, a mineral. Uh, this causes the denaturation of cell proteins on contact. Uh, Bacillus subtilis, this is an interesting example of a microbial fungicide. Uh, this material is actually uh, uh, applied to plants where it actually outcompetes the uh, uh, pathogenic organisms that would be attacking the plant. And in some cases, it uh, 
it actively kills the pathogen. So again, a very, very interesting interaction. Serenade uh, is, is a brand name, and there's both so, uh, soil and foliar um, applications of serenade. Trichoderma hartsianum, another interesting example of a microbial uh, fungicide, uh, root shield and plant shield, of soil and foliar applications. It too outcompetes pathogens on roots or leaf surfaces. And then in a few cases, it actually parasitizes or kills pathogens. Hydrogen peroxide, a common name is oxidate. This is an inorganic chemical. It oxidizes and disrupts cell membranes on contact. So again, this is an example of a material that is applied uh, when the uh, organism of interest is actually present on the plant. Uh, potassium bicarbonate, another example of a mineral. This is a, a common brand name is Millstop. It too is applied on contact and it disrupts pathogen cell walls. Uh, a very interesting material is coniothyrin minitans, uh, the brand name Contans. That's much easier to say than the, uh, the uh, Latin name. This is a microbial fungicide, and it is effective against certain diseases such as uh, sclerotyrum, which uh, develops these resting stages called sclerotia. These are found in the soil, and they're a point of infection for long periods of time when they're present in the soil. But Contans actually... Uh, by its activity will destroy these resting stages, these, these sclerotia. And then uh, an example of an elemental uh, fungicide is sulfur, and a common form is dusting sulfur. Sulfur can also be applied in a vaporized form as well. It's a contact fungicide, <clears throat> inhibits pathogen spore germination. And then turning our attention to weeds. It's important when we think about weed management that first of all, we understand weeds. And again, there, there are differences from the standpoint of organic herbicides and their effectiveness against broadleaf or grass weeds. So again, we wanna target the right herbicide to the type of weed we're dealing with. Annual perennial weeds. In general, perennial weeds are more difficult to manage with organic herbicides than annual weeds. And then warm season or cool season weeds. And it's important to understand this aspect of weed life cycles because it guides when we think about management strategies. And then we, want, of course, want to think about the interaction of the crop and the weeds and the best time to control the weeds. Now, some general thoughts on using organic herbicides. In general, organic herbicides are more useful against germinating annual and perennial weeds when they're very small, you know, when they're just germinating. The smaller the weed, the more effective organic herbicides are. In general, organic herbicides are more, more effective when we use high spray volumes. In other words, we want to thoroughly coat the uh, germinating seedlings with the herbicide. It can be helpful to use adjuvants. Adjuvants are materials that actually help move the herbicide inside the plant. And then keep in mind that with, with almost all organic herbicides, there's no residual. And as we get fresh crops of germinating weed seedlings, we may need to reapply the organic herbicide. So in other words, repeat applications are part of the effective use of organic herbicides. And here's some examples of organic herbicides. Uh, first of all, acetic acid. Uh, we commonly know that as vinegar, and we can see several of the, uh, the uh, uh, product names of acetic acid. Keep in mind that with uh, the herbicidal use of acetic acid, these are materials that have a higher concentration of acetic acid than, say, the uh, typical vinegar that we would purchase. Uh, acetic acid and citric acid combinations. Here are some examples of those. Uh, citric acid alone is effective against uh, certain things. Uh, blackberry and brush block as an example. Citric acid plus clove oil is, are the active ingredients in the herbicide burnout. Clove oil on its own uh, in, in found in Avenger, clove oil and cinnamon oil in weed zap, and clove leaf oil in Matran. Then we have eugenol uh, found in weed slayer, and then eugenol plus several other materials found in EcoSmart, which is a, a widely used organic herbicide. Lemongrass oil has some effectiveness, and Green Match is an example of a brand name. Ammonium nonanoate in, in Axe is an example, and then the herbicide Psy contains pelargonic acid plus fatty acids. Now, I'll comment briefly on rodents and birds, and in most cases, organic management of these pests is focused on exclusion. You know, if you see these uh, sweet potatoes, for example, at least on my farm, I had a lot of damage this year from voles feeding on sweet potatoes. And these came out of my high tunnel. And uh, very clearly, I need to do a better job of excluding voles from the high tunnel to get better control. Okay, 
Hannah, do we have any questions at this point about uh, uh, particular types of organic insecticides, fungicides, or herbicides? It doesn't appear so. Okay, very good. Now let's talk about pesticides in the environment. And first of all, let's recognize that the environment actually has effects on pesticides. We'll be spending most of our time in this section talking about the effect of pesticides on the environment, but the environment can, can affect the, uh, how, how well a pesticide works. And so first of all, it can affect the target pests. You know, for example, if you're applying an organic insecticide that has to contact the insects and the uh, environment is such that these, uh, these insects are undercover, you know, for example, if it's, if, if it's too cold out and they may be present, but they may be undercover and it may be difficult to actually contact them with the organic insecticide. The environment may also affect the application rate the environment can affect the length of time that a pesticide is effective. A good example here would be comparing an application of a, an organic insecticide inside of a tunnel with that same application in the outside environment. And frequently the application in the outside environment will be effective for a much shorter period of time than that same application within the tunnel. And it's because the tunnel environment uh, slows down the, uh, the degradation of the, uh, the insecticide. Now, Keep in mind that there can actually be a, an opposite situation when it comes to fungicides. Oftentimes, organic fungicides are applied to plants and they have to be present in a protective layer on the plant. And as the plant grows, it actually grows out of this protective layer. And plants tend to grow more quickly in a tunnel environment. And so it may be necessary to apply organic fungicides more frequently within the tunnel than it would be in the outside environment. And then uh, wherever the situation, recognize the rainfall can reduce the effectiveness of most organic pesticides. Uh, first of all, by washing it off of the plant. And in some cases, just the activity of the rainfall can degrade the, uh, the uh, pesticide itself. And I'll, sh I'll mention as well too, that uh, there are certain situations, you know, for example, the use of, of uh, 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 Dipel, the use of uh, uh, this particular material is, is very much dependent upon environmental conditions. You know, particularly direct sunlight can very quickly break down Dipel when it's applied to plants. So again, recognize that uh, there are factors that can actually reduce the effectiveness of organic pesticides. Now let's turn our attention to the environment itself and some general things to think about from the standpoint of minimizing the impact, the environmental impact uh, with the uh, use of organic pesticides. First of all, very important to keep pesticides on the target. Uh, when we apply pesticides, we need to be doing it for a specific purpose, okay? Uh, in general, when we talk about the application of pesticides in an organic production situation, we're not talking about general widespread use of pesticides. We're talking about targeted use, frequently in response to monitoring where we've identified places where these pesticides are useful. We want to avoid uh, applying pesticides in ways that they move off target. Whenever a pesticide moves off target, it carries the risk of impacting populations of pollinators and beneficials in areas adjacent to crop plants. Uh, in the case of herbicides, you run the risk of damaging plants that are outside of the uh, treated area. You can even damage the crop plant if the herbicide moves off target. So again, you need to take practices to avoid off target movement. But what are these practices? Well, uh, applying pesticides, applying pesticides of uh, organic pesticides when environmental conditions do not favor this, this problem. You know, for example, uh, avoid windy periods when applying pesticides, avoid applying pesticides just before rains, and avoid applying pesticides when the environmental conditions favor the, uh, the uh, drift or, or the off-target movement through what are called uh, temperature inversions. Now, what happens to pesticides in the environment? Um, you know, when we apply a pesticide, our goal is to apply it to the target but some of it does uh, just unavoidably miss the target. Uh, for example, if it, if it hits the soil, it can, the uh, pesticides can actually be adsorbed to soil particles and they can remain present for a period of time where they can impact soil life. And this can be a negative aspect. Uh, they can be transferred. You know, for example, uh, pesticides can be washed into the soil and they can actually enter uh, groundwater and cause problems. Thankfully, this is not a uh, a serious risk with organic pesticides that certainly is with a number of conventional pesticides. And then pesticides can be degraded. Again, uh, degraded through the action of uh, uh, sunlight and, and ultraviolet light. Uh, 
and also degraded through the action of organisms that are found in on the soil surface or within the soil. Very important to think about the impacts of organic pesticide use in water. And in fact, it's, it's important for organic farmers to, to go to great lengths to minimize the impact of pesticide use on water. So again, very important to store pesticides properly so that we don't have the, uh, the uh, uh, for example, if you're storing pesticides in an area that might flood, this can be a serious situation. Make sure that applicators, uh, spray tanks, and other ways that we apply pesticides are clean. But as we clean them, we need to collect the rinsate, the water that we're using to, to clean these uh, applicators, and make sure that that water doesn't become a problem, either through runoff or through movement into uh, uh, wastewater systems. We need to have in place backflow prevention on our water sources. You know, For example, if you're using a well to fill a spray tank, and the, uh, the end of the hose ends up below the surface of the uh, water in the tank, when you turn the, uh, the uh, water source off, when you turn off the hydrant, there is the possibility there could be some backflow, some suction that can move the pesticide mixture in your spray tank into the hose and possibly down into your well. And this can, again, can be a very difficult situation to correct. It's important when using wells and, and when using surface waters, or in fact, with any water source, that you install backflow prevention at some point in your water supply system so that you don't have to worry about this issue. Think about your wellheads and try to set things up so that if you're applying, for example, uh, herbicides in the vicinity of a well, we don't have the problem with uh, water, again, just water from rainfall, moving to the wellhead that contains pesticides and then down the casing of the well. Seal abandoned wells. You know, A well is basically a conduit to groundwater. If there's an abandoned well that's open, there's always the possibility that pesticide contaminated water might enter that well. If rain is forecasted, delay applications. Uh, it's a good practice to maintain borders around sprayed areas to help catch any movement of, uh, of sprays uh, in, in water from a sprayed area into areas that you're trying to protect. Understand your geology. You know, for example, if you're uh, farming in an area near a sinkhole, recognize that a sinkhole too is a direct conduit to groundwater and be very cautious about any pesticide use in the vicinity of the sinkhole. The same could be said for caves and, and other naturally occurring openings. And then the, the bottom line is to use pesticides only when necessary. And we've mentioned this several times tonight and we'll, we'll mention it again. Make sure you use pesticides only when necessary and use them at the lowest effective rates. Okay, now let's talk a bit more about understanding organic pesticides. And when we think about pesticides, again, we want to think first of all about the type of pesticide that we're working with. And the first thing to think about it, is it a restricted use pesticide? And uh, by law, restricted use pesticides are labeled such. And restricted use pesticides tend to be dangerous pesticides. Again, thankfully, most organic pesticides are not restricted use pesticides. And it's important to recognize here in Missouri as well that legally, you must have undergone pesticide applicator training before you can purchase and use restricted use pesticides. Uh, the label will clearly um, indicate which pesticides are restricted use. Uh, understand the target pest. Again, you, you, you choose your organic pesticide based upon the target pest. You also choose an organic pesticide based upon the crop or the plant that you're going to apply it to. You know, there are pesticides, for example, that can damage certain types of crop plants even though they may be labeled or available to use on other types of crop plants for the same target pest. So recognize that the, it's important to understand the interface of the target pest and the, uh, the crop when we choose a type of pesticide. Now let's talk a little bit about active ingredients and formulations. And so when we think about active ingredients, you know, we saw those lists earlier, and those told us what was in that pesticide that actually had the uh, desired uh, effect on the, 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 uh, the pest of interest. And this is done through what's called modes of action. And again, we noticed when we were talking about organic insecticides and organic fungicides that different uh, pesticides target different, different aspects of the, uh, the, uh, the pest of interest. You know, for example, there may be uh, insecticides that target the uh, nerve centers of insects, or there may be insecticides that, that act in the uh, gut of the insect. Well, these are called modes of action. And it's important to understand these modes of action because when we think about um, the, uh, 
the uh, use of these, these pesticides, we always have to be conscious of what's called pest resistance. And this is a situation where a pest can actually develop resistance to a pesticide. It's, it's well documented, it's happened many times in the past, and it's an ongoing issue into the future. And to help manage pesticide resistance, it's important to use pesticides that have different modes of action. You know, again, when we think about, say, managing an insect, recognize that in most cases with organic insecticides, we have to apply more than one application. And if we use the same organic insecticide for the first application, then for the second, the third, the fourth, and, and, and on, then in time, we will actually set up a situation where that insect will naturally select for individuals within their populations that are resistant to that particular insecticide. And in time, the insecticide will no longer be effective. In order to slow down this process, there is a strong recommendation to alternate modes of action. And in fact, labels have recognized this. The Environmental Protection Agency has recognized the importance of this by developing what are called mode of action codes. And you may see the terms FRAC, IRAC, and HRAC. Well, FRAC stands for the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, which has taken a look at all the different fungicides, organic fungicides that are currently labeled and identified them as far as their modes of action. And this makes it very easy for a farmer to look at the different modes of action and choose materials that can be then incorporated into a spray program where we alternate modes of action. So again, very important to consider this. IRAC is the uh, Insecticide Resistance Action Committee and HRAC is the Herbicide Resistance Action Committee. Now, some other things to think about. Uh, what is the formulation? Is it a dry formulation? And it's important to recognize that you know, within dry formulations, we have some types that are applied as powders or dusts. Others said, yes, they are dry, but they're intended to be mixed with water before they're applied. And again, if you make a mistake, a good example would be sulfur. There are sulfur formulations that are uh, meant to be applied as a sulfur dust. And then there are also what are called wettable sulfur formulations, where the sulfur has been treated in such a way that it will uh, form a slurry when you mix water with it, and it can actually be sprayed onto plants at that point. If you try to use dusting sulfur and mix water with it, it will not go into suspension. So it's important to understand that. And then we have liquid formulations of several types as well. Adjuvants, important to understand these as well. And these are materials that uh, typically enhance the performance of a pesticide's activity when it's been applied to a crop. And uh, uh, an example would be a drift control additive. This is a material that's applied to a pesticide to help keep it from drifting. And this can be very helpful from the standpoint of minimizing the off-target movement of an organic pesticide. We have surfactants, and this, these are helpful, uh, particularly for applying an organic pesticide to a plant that has a shiny or a waxy leaf surface. You know, for example, if you're applying a, uh, something like Dipel to, to uh, brassicas to control cabbage worms, it can be very difficult to get liquid formulations to stick to the surface of brassica leaves. But by using a surfactant along with the Dipel, you can help that material stick to the leaves. Then we have penetrants. And an example of the use of a penetrant would be with an organic herbicide, where our goal is to help move that herbicide into the, uh, the plants and get better control. We have buffering agents. These are materials that actually buffer the pH of the uh, spray tank. And we have certain organic pesticides that actually lose effectiveness if the pH of the uh, spray tank is too high or too low. And a buffering agent helps keep the uh, spray tank pH, the, the uh, mixture pH, right where it needs to be. And then there are compatibility agents. And these are materials that are added to mixtures of organic pesticides to make sure that they will will work well together to make sure that when you mix them together, they don't cause an adverse reaction. And on the subject of pesticide mixtures, you always be careful when you mix pesticides. You know, it can be nice to, to mix, for example, an insecticide and a fungicide and just have to make one application rather than having to make up two different batches of spray and spray plants twice. But when you mix materials, you have to be very cautious because sometimes incompatibility can be a problem. And when we talk about incompatibility, it may be a situation where if you mix two pesticides, they actually lose effectiveness. You don't get the benefit of the application. Uh, you know, there may be some sort of chemical reaction among the mixture. We can also have a situation where the mixture can actually produce a combination that damages plants. And then in some cases, we get a situation where if you mix pesticides together, 
you actually get a situation where one or the other will come out of solution and you get a, a mixture that you can't apply through a sprayer. You know, for example, you may drop out of solution and form a sludge or a, or a, a sediment or some other issue that prevents its, its uh, uh, application through a sprayer. So it's, it's important before you mix pesticides that you understand uh, incompatibility. And typically the pesticide label will include information on compatibility and incompatibility. And then let's talk about timing. You know, when is the best time to apply an organic pesticide? Again, uh, the label is going to give you guidance on when you should apply an organic pesticide. It's frequently, as we've mentioned before, tied to plant growth stage and to a point in the pest life cycle. But again, the importance of scouting and watching your plants so that you know when pests are present and when they've reached threshold levels is a very important part of timing a spray application. If you spray too early or too late, you may not see the benefit of the spray. You may be wasting money and you may be unnecessarily impacting the environment in your garden or on your farm. Multiple applications. As I mentioned before, most organic pesticides do not have long-term uh, residual activity. And so they may need to be applied more than once to get adequate control of a pest. And then finally, residues and tolerances. Again, as we mentioned earlier, the Environmental Protection Agency is charged with, with uh, developing safe residue and tolerance levels as far as pesticides on crops. And with this in mind, we have to recognize the pesticide use obviously is going to affect residues. Uh, not just pesticide use, but also the environmental conditions following a pesticide application. That it is very important that we follow the label when it comes to pesti organic pesticide use, because if we use an organic pesticide at, at too high of a concentration, or perhaps if we use it too close to harvest, we can have problems with, with uh, unsafe residues of that pesticide on the crop when we do harvest it. So again, very important to, uh, to adhere to label rates and application timing and pre-harvest intervals. Okay, do we have any questions at this point, Hannah, as far as just general thoughts on organic pesticides? We do. Uh, we have a question from Tina Valance. Um, do organic pesticides expire or have a shelf life? Organic pest, well, any pesticide, including organic pesticides, does do have shelf lives. And this is particularly the case if we're working with, with uh, biological agents. You know, if we're working with a living organism as a pesticide, obviously that living organism has a lifespan, you know, a period of time in which it's effective. And there will be frequently information on the label that will help guide you as far as the, the length of time that you, you can expect that pesticide to be effective. It's also very important once pesticides have been purchased that they're held and stored under proper environmental conditions to help prolong the period of time at which they're effective. You know, we'll talk about pesticide storage here in, in a few minutes, but the uh, conditions that lead to the loss of effectiveness in pesticides are things such as storing them in wet environments, storing them under high temperatures, storing them, particularly in the case of, of liquid formulations under very cold conditions can, uh, can lead to loss of effectiveness. Uh, the bottom line is it's, it's best to purchase the amount of pesticide that you need for immediate use. And then if you do have to store it, consider short-term storage as the option. You know, the idea of buying five years worth of pesticide and storing it is typically not a good idea. Other questions? Uh, awesome. No, uh, there are no more questions. Okay. Let's spend a little time looking at an organic pesticide label. And again, uh, the label is, is uh, it's law. You know, the, the Environmental Protection Agency, as I mentioned earlier, is charged with developing pesticide labels. And these labels carry the force of law. And if you use a pesticide in a way that is not in accordance with the label, you're breaking the law. And what's more important, the uh, information on the label is developed as the result of exhaustive testing and, and, and many, 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 many research trials to help understand the safe use of that pesticide, and particularly the uh, levels of residue that are safe with that pesticide. So if you use a pesticide not in accordance with the label, you also run the risk of uh, having unsafe residues on crops when they're harvested. And this, of course, can, can open you up to liability if someone becomes ill from consuming a uh, a uh, crop that has unsafe residues. 
Okay, now the first step in uh, understanding organic pesticide labels is to understand whether or not this is an organic pesticide. And as I mentioned before, the Environmental Protection Agency defers to the National Organic Program to, to label pesticides as organic. But again, almost universally, both the EPA and the NOP will uh, look to OMRI, to the Organic Materials Review Institute, for guidance in what is allowed and what is not allowed in organic production. And so frequently, organic pesticides will carry the OMRI seal. And we see it here. We also see it here. And we'll be using Entrust as our, our uh, model from the standpoint of labels here for the next few slides. But if we look at the Entrust label, we can see the OMRI seal. We sometimes also see this check mark for organic production seal on organic pesticides. So that's the first thing to look for when you're considering a pesticide, whether or not it's an organic pesticide. Now, this is important to, to understand because there can be very similar uh, active ingredients that are not organic. And an example here, here's our Entrust Organic label, which contains a, a spinosad-derived uh, material that is an OMRI-approved organic material. But then we have a pesticide called Delegate. It's also an insecticide. It also contains a, a, a spinosad-derived substance, but it is not allowable in organic production. It does not carry the, uh, the uh, OMRI seal, and this would not be allowed in most organic production settings. So again, two materials, very similar active ingredients, uh, identical modes of action, but one is an organic material and one is not. Okay, let's, let's delve in a little bit deeper into our Entrust label here. And let's first look at safety information that is found on the uh, pesticide label. Pesticide labels carry what are called signal words. And this is just a, a very quick clue to how toxic that material is. And in terms of toxicity, the most uh, toxic pesticides carry the, the uh, uh, signal words danger poison. And then less toxic warning and least toxic caution. Most organic pesticides will carry the, uh, war the uh, signal word caution. And we can see that right there. Now, there are a few organic pesticides that carry the signal word warning, so recognize that those tend to be the more dangerous organic pesticides. Pesticide labels by law have to carry a child hazard warning. With uh, more toxic pesticides, this can be quite involved. In the case of less toxic materials like Entrust, it's oftentimes a fairly brief note. And here on this label, the uh, child hazard warning is keep out of reach of children. Practical treatment. The pesticide label will include information uh, from the standpoint of first aid if a person is accidentally poisoned through the, uh, the uh, use of that particular uh, pesticide. And here we see the uh, first aid statement on the Entrust label, and it's focused on the, the uh, uh, if, if you have a problem with, with eyes. And so it says, in eyes, hold eye open and rinse slowly and gently with water for 15 to 20 minutes. Let's remove contact lenses if present. After the first five minutes, then continue rinsing eye. Call a poison control center or doctor for treatment advice. Now, if you look at some of the uh, conventional pesticides, the uh, first aid uh, treatment note will be very long and very involved. But again, thankfully, most organic pesticides are low in toxicity. There'll be notes related to hazards to animals and humans. Here's that hazard here. And then there'll be information on personal protective equipment. And we'll be talking more about this here in a moment. And here we can see on this particular label, we have actually two places at the very bottom. It talks about personal protective equipment for applicators or someone who's actually gonna be spraying and trust on crops. And there it says long sleeve shirt, and long pants. And then it also says um, shoes and socks, shoes plus socks. Then we look at uh, the other note, and that's related to people who are mixing uh, up a tank of Entrust. And keep in mind that uh, pesticides are always more dangerous in their concentrated forms. You know, when we think about the risk associated with pesticide use, it all comes down to dose. And we're much more likely to be injured through exposure to a pesticide when it's in its concentrated form. So oftentimes the label will have personal protective equipment guidance that is more strict for people who are mixing up the pesticide. And we'll notice here on this particular label, it says that uh, for people who are mixing an approved dust or mist filtering respirator 
uh, should be used. And again, follow manufacturer's instructions for cleaning and maintaining PPE. So there's our guidance from the standpoint of personal protective equipment. And then there'll be a note re related to environmental hazards. And frequently this is related to, to two things. It's related to uh, hazards related to water and hazards related to bees and pollinators. And we can see here on, on this particular label, even though this is an organic insecticide, there is a note that this product is toxic to bees exposed to treatment for three hours following treatment. And then there'll be guidance there on how to, to uh, minimize the risk to, to, uh, to honeybees. The next thing to look at is product information. And there'll be a use classification, again, whether or not it's restricted use or general use, and that is typically at the very top of the label. And as I mentioned, um, very few organic pesticides carry the restricted use label. But again, looking at our Entrust label, there is no note as far as it being restricted use. So it, this is a general use organic insecticide. There'll be the brand name, Entrust. There'll be an ingredient statement. And in this case, it's spinosad. Notice again that uh, the material is, is uh, uh, in this case, it's about 80% spinosad. And then there's about 20% other, you know, which are frequently inert ingredients to, to again, make up the total of 100%. And then there'll be an EPA registration number and sometimes an EPA establishment number. The registration number is unique to this particular type of, of pesticide. And the establishment number is related to where the pesticide is manufactured. Now, in this case, this is a specimen label. It's not an actual label off of a container of Entrust. If it were off the container of Entrust, it would have the establishment label where that particular, uh, where the contents of that particular container was, was manufactured. Uh, there'll be a net contents label here. And again, it talks about 80%, and that's all right there. And then frequently there's the name and address of the manufacturer, the formulation, and physical and chemical hazards. And they're actually present on this label, but they were on other pages, so I didn't, didn't point them out with arrows. Now, the bulk of a pesticide label is the directions for use. In other words, the guidance from the Environmental Protection Agency, first of all, on how to use this material so that it's effective, but also how to use it in such a way that it minimizes the impact on the environment and it results in residues on the, the harvested crops that are safe for humans. And so again, the, uh, the directions for use will include the crops that this material can be applied to, the amount to use, you know, in other words, the application rate, the ways of applying it, the timing and frequency of application, the re-entry time, which is the period of time that must elapse from when the material is applied to the crop, and then workers can go back in and work in that crop. There'll also be information on the pests controlled, and then any limitations or restrictions. So again, let's take a look at an actual example. Let's say that our goal is to control spotted wing drosophila, which is that little fruit fly there in the upper right, on elderberry. So we're looking at the Entrust label and we're reading through uh, all the uh, different types of crops that this material can be used on. And frequently the, uh, the uh, use instructions are broken down based upon crops. Well, we come to the section called bushberries, okay? And we look in that long list of, of uh, specific crops that are included under bushberries and we notice that Indeed, elderberry is listed here. So when trust can be applied to elderberry, that's the first question to answer. But is it effective on elderberry against spotted wing drosophila? So now let's look under the list of pests that Entrust manages. And we read down that list and we notice that yes, indeed it does help control spotted wing drosophila. So that's the second thing that we must verify on the label before we can use this pesticide uh, as, as intended. So yes, we can use it on elderberry because elderberry is listed on the label. And yes, it's going to help in managing spotted wing drosophila. Well, the next step is to figure out how much we're allowed to, to apply. What rate are we allowed to apply and trust to elderberry to get good control of spotted wing drosophila? And if we look at the label, there's guidance there as far as the rate. And in this case, we can apply four to six fluid ounces of entrust per acre. Now, in some cases, we may need the uh, the rate in, in something smaller than an acre increment. And frequently labels will have uh, conversion tables where we convert this down to say amount needed per thousand square feet, or in some cases, even the amount needed per plant in the case of, of uh, uh, for example, spraying a fruit tree. 
Now there's other information on here. Uh, here's some information on application timing. Treat when pests appear, targeting eggs that hatch or small larva. So that gives us advice if we're going to control it, uh, if we're going to use it to control spotted wing drosophila, we need to apply it when the uh, spotted wing drosophila is present. Uh, we have some information on, uh, further information on the application rate, a big section on resistance management, and particularly with spotted wing drosophila, resistance management is critically important because this particular insect very quickly develops resistance to pesticides. So our resistance management guidance is to not make more than two consecutive applications of this insecticide. Uh, if additional treatments are required after two consecutive applications, rotate to another class of effective insecticides for at least one application. Again, very important to understand that. And then we'll notice that we have some restrictions. Our pre-harvest interval do not apply within one day of harvest. Minimum treatment interval do not make applications less than six days apart. We also have a maximum amount, a, a maximum number of applications that can be made, do not make more than six applications per calendar year. We also have a restriction on how much we can apply, do not apply more than a total of 29 fluid ounces per acre per crop per year, okay? And then at the very bottom, we have some special use restrictions for applying to certain counties in California. So again, a, a great deal of information on how to use an organic insecticide effectively is found on the pesticide label. The pesticide label will also give us some, some information on storage and disposal. And so we can uh, notice here on this particular label, uh, it, it uh, is required that we use this material so that we don't contaminate water, food, or feed by the way that we store it or the way that we dispose of the uh, pesticide or containers. Pesticide storage, we must store in the original container only. Pesticide disposal, uh, waste resulting from the use of this product must be disposed of on site or at an approved waste disposal facility. Uh, we have some guidance here as far as non-refillable rigid containers or non-rigid containers. Also, if we purchase this material in an amount larger than five gallons, we have information there as well. So again, the label will give us information on how we can safely store this organic pesticide and how we can dispose of the pesticide itself or the packaging that uh, is involved in, in the pesticide. There is also some companion documentation called the SDS or the safety data sheet. And each pesticide also has, has a safety data sheet. And it's uh, uh, of interest for uh, people who are using organic pesticides to also have on hand the SDS sheet. Now the SDS sheet is not typically attached to the pesticide container as the label is. Uh, frequently you can, you can locate SDS sheets uh, from uh, websites. You can also request them from the supplier of the pesticide. But there's a, a great deal of technical information on the SDS sheet that is not found on the pesticide label. Is it necessary to have the SDS sheet in hand before using a pesticide? No, it is not. But it is required that you have the label in hand before using a pesticide. Okay, do we have any questions on what is on the pesticide label? No questions right now. Okay, now let's talk a bit about personal protective equipment. In other words, the uh, uh, types of equipment that are available to help keep us safe as we apply or as we handle and apply organic pesticides. And when we talk about these things, we wanna think about, first of all, the ways the pesticides can enter our bodies. Uh, we can certainly uh, uh, have a situation where pesticides can move through our skin, uh, any part of the body. Uh, this is called the dermal route. You know, there are certain parts of the body where the skin is actually uh, more likely to take pesticides in. You know, for example, your forehead tends to be an area where, where pesticides can, can readily enter the body. We can also inhale pesticides. And this is of course called the inhalation route. And then pesticides can enter the body through, uh, through uh, uh, the oral route. We can actually ingest them or swallow them. And then finally, pesticides can enter our bodies through our eyes. And when we think about personal protective equipment, we think about blocking all of these routes of entry of pesticides into our body. Let's take a quick look at a video that uh, describes personal protective equipment. <laughs> 
I'm Patrick Byers, Horticulture Field Specialist with University of Missouri Extension. Let's talk about Personal Protective Equipment, or PPE. PPE is designed to keep you safe when you use pesticides. And a good way to start the discussion is to think about the ways the pesticides can enter the body. They can certainly enter through the dermal route, through your skin. They can also enter through the oral route by, by ingesting pesticides. They can enter through your respiratory tract by breathing in pesticides. And finally, they can enter through your eyes. And when we think about personal protective equipment, we think about ways to protect all of those, those parts of the body uh, to, to reduce risk from all of those routes of pesticide entry. Always remember that the pesticide label will contain guidance on the level of PPE needed to protect yourself from the pesticide. A good starting point with many pesticides is to wear a long sleeve shirt, to wear long pants, and then to wear shoes and socks. And for many pesticides, this is the level of PPE needed. So here are some examples of personal protective equipment. Boots, gloves, a suit that fits over the entire body, goggles, a respirator, and then that may be specialized personal protective equipment used when dealing with pesticides in their concentrated form, a face shield and an apron. Let's talk about boots for a moment. A good pair of boots from the standpoint of personal protective equipment are typically rubber. Rubber is better than leather. Leather, if it's exposed to pesticide, tends to concentrate that pesticide against the skin. It's also impossible to adequately clean uh, leather boots that have been contaminated with pesticides. Choose boots that are mid-calf in length and choose boots that are unlined. Gloves for personal protective equipment may be made out of several materials. Here's an example of a pair made out of neoprene. A typical glove for personal protective equipment will be gauntlet length. You want them large enough so that it's easy to put your hand into, but yet small enough that you can function with the size of the glove. Gloves may be placed either within the cuff or outside of the cuff of your shirt or your, your uh, coveralls. Outside, if you're working overhead, inside the cuff if you're working with your hands in this position. Some pesticide labels require the use of a suit to protect the entire body from pesticide exposure. Here's an example of such a suit. Typically, these suits are made out of materials such as Tyvek. Some of these suits are intended for single use while others can be washed. Frequently, these suits will have elastic at the ankles, as we see here, also at the wrists, to provide for protection from exposure from the feet and the hands. They frequently will also have hoods where you can protect the head from pesticide exposure. Goggles are an excellent way to protect your eyes from exposure to pesticide. Goggles should be clear. Frequently they have lenses that can be replaced when the original lens becomes scratched. Vents are helpful to keep the goggles from ste uh, steaming up. And if you wear glasses, make sure that you size the goggles so that you can put them on comfortably over your glasses. The pesticide label may call for the use of a respirator to reduce the risk of inhaling pesticides. We have an example of a respirator here. Make sure you choose a respirator that carries a seal of inspection of a group such as the National Institutes of Safety and Health, or NIOSH. The respirator has several parts. There'll be a headpiece that fits over the head. There is a rubber piece that fits around the mouth and the nose. Remember that if you have facial hair, it's actually very difficult to get a good seal between this rubber piece and your face. Respirators have canisters. These canisters are of various parts. This particular respirator has an outer canister that features a pad that catches particulates or dusts, pesticides that might be in that form. And then there's an inner canister that is intended to catch organic vapors. Within this inner canister is activated charcoal. Now, if you're using a respirator and you begin to detect the smell of pesticides, it's time to replace these canisters. Respirators require uh, some degree of maintenance. Always remember that you're most at risk from the standpoint of pesticide exposure when you're working with the concentrated pesticide. So the pesticide label may require you to wear specialized personal protective equipment when you're mixing with the concentrated form of the pesticide. As an example, it may require the use of a chemical resistant apron. And here we have an example of, of such an apron. And it fits around the body like this. And it may also require the use 
of the face shield. Again, this gives you a little bit of extra protection from the standpoint of exposure to the concentrated pesticide. Frequently, these types of PPE will be needed in addition to the uh, more routine types of, of personal protective equipment that we've already discussed. So let's review personal protective equipment. Remember, the first step is always to check the pesticide label. The label will contain guidance on the level of PPE needed to protect you from that particular pesticide. Remember that a good foundation is a long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes, and socks. Additional items of PPE will be mentioned on the label. They might include rubber boots. They might include chemical resistant gloves. They may require the use of goggles or a respirator, perhaps a full body spray suit, and special personal protective equipment used when you're mixing the concentrated form of the pesticide. Okay, a final note before we leave personal protective equipment is, uh, is uh, a note about laundering pesticide contaminated clothing. And if you're applying pesticides in, uh, it's almost inevitable that you'll have some degree of pesticide residue on your clothing. And it's important to, to recognize this when it com comes time to launder that clothing. And, and I will mention that after applying an organic pesticide, it's a good practice to at the very least wash your hands and wash your face. Um, I typically suggest that people consider showering after applying an organic pesticide. And then the clothing should be laundered separate from the other household clothing. Typically, any residues that would be found on clothing will be broken down by the laundering process. And it's also a good practice to hang clothing after it's been laundered in the sun for further degradation of any residues by, by the uh, sunlight. Okay, we, we will close out with some, again, some general thoughts on uh, handling storage and disposal. And again, recognize that first of all, organic pesticides are poisons and, and it has to be recognized that they do carry some level of risk from the standpoint of their use. Uh, think about the routes by which pesticides can enter the body. Always, always leave pesticides in their original containers. This is the law and it's also just plain common sense. Uh, many poisonings related to pesticides have resulted when people move pesticides from their original containers and put them into unlabeled containers and people didn't recognize them for what they were and uh, poisoning resulted. I remember that children are vulnerable to pesticide poisoning. Children oftentimes don't take time to read labels. Um, they also have a smaller body mass and they're more vulnerable to pesticide poisoning at lower levels than, than adults are. And then again, remember that pets and animals are also vulnerable to pesticide poisoning. And when we talk about storage, it's important to have storage areas that are secure from the standpoint of children and pets and animals. It's always in your interest to reduce pesticide use. And uh, we talked about uh, integrated pest management and how the, the development of an IPM program can help reduce the use of pesticides. There are non-pesticide management strategies. Always follow the label closely. The label will give you guidance on allowable rates Remember that safe storage is, is critical. I mean, if you can safely store pesticides, then those pesticides can then be uh, uh, available for use at, at another time. So, you know, for example, purchasing a pesticide, uh, you don't have to, to use it immediately if you have adequate storage. Use up pesticides for the intended use, and then be sure that you dispose of empty packaging and containers properly as guided by the label. Now, as far as safety, when you're actually applying a pesticide, again, remember your, your personal protective equipment, make sure that you prepare the spray mixture properly, make sure that you operate the sprayer correctly. Um, I could tell you horror stories about uh, situations where people have poisoned themselves during the preparation of a tank of spray. Make sure that you apply sprays properly as well. Don't apply on inclement days, don't apply when the environmental conditions are not favorable for keeping the spray on the target plants. Don't apply pesticides when you're tired or you're impaired. Uh, make sure that you clean your equipment properly after pesticide use, collect the rinsate and reuse it. And then have a, a plan in place if there's a pesticide spill. It's, it's always possible that you could drop a container of concentrated pesticide and have a spill. And again, there's guidance on the pesticide label from the standpoint of managing spills. Uh, 
Pesticide storage, uh, we've touched on this already and we'll revisit it now, the storage must be secure. Pesticides must be stored in an area where they cannot be accessed by unauthorized people. The storage must be dry, and it, first of all, to maintain the, uh, the effectiveness of the pesticide, but also mixtures of pesticides and water oftentimes over time can lead to a, a sometimes explosive situations. So be cautious about that. It's a good practice to have pesticide storage areas that are temperature controlled to keep pesticides from freezing or becoming too warm. Make sure that you label storage areas so that everyone knows what is inside that area. Make sure that it's a dedicated storage area. You don't want to uh, store pesticides in areas where they could un uh, unknowingly contaminate other things. So it should be a dedicated storage area. It doesn't necessarily have to be a separate building, but it could certainly be an area within a building, but it needs to be a dedicated area. Don't store pesticides close to wells or water sources. I've seen situations where, where farmers have stored pesticides in their well house because that's an area that they, they have set up so it doesn't freeze during the winter, but that's a, a very risky situation. And then don't store pesticides adjacent to fertilizers, fuel, packaging, or food and produce. Again, you know, think about the, the uh, effects of, of, uh, of a pesticide spill and mixtures of pesticides and fertilizers and fuel can be very explosive and dangerous. And obviously we don't want to contaminate packaging for produce and we don't want to contaminate food or the produce itself. We'll conclude with some resources. Uh, again, there are a number of, of uh, production guides that include organic uh, pesticide recommendations. And the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide and the Midwest Fruit Spray Guide are examples of, of uh, regional guides that contain information that it's very helpful from the standpoint of choosing an organic pesticide. The uh, tree fruit and the small fruit pest management handbooks are useful IPM tools when it comes to identifying insect disease and other pests that can damage uh, specialty crops. Here are the websites that I mentioned earlier, the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and information on their uh, organic guidance, the uh, USDA National Organic Program, and then the Organic Materials Review Institute or OMRI. So these websites are very helpful from the standpoint of understanding what is and is not an organic pesticide. The National Pesticide Information Center, which is uh, uh, coordinated through Oregon State University is very helpful. That there's some, some very useful lists there as far as uh, organic pesticides and active ingredients. And then here in Missouri, the uh, Private Pesticide Applicator Manual, although it's general, the information in this manual is very helpful in guiding the uh, safe use of organic pesticides as well. I'll mention that we are posting the recordings of our Springfield Community Garden online videos at the uh, Springfield Community Garden YouTube channel. And we have videos on a wide range of subjects, including understanding and managing weeds and understanding and managing diseases. So refer to these, uh, these uh, workshop recordings for more information specific to weeds and diseases. And uh, I always like to include a, a picture of a grandchild somewhere in the presentation. And again, this is what it's all about. It's, it's important that when we uh, choose to use organic pesticides, we consider the, uh, the impacts of that pesticide use on, on everything around us, certainly the environment, the uh, crop plants, but also the people who are in the environment of the farm, the people who will be consuming the products that we grow on our farms. Thank you.